In this lecture video, I'm going to briefly introduce you to the next coupling reaction in our lineup, which is called the Stille reaction. In addition to the Gilman, Suzuki, and Heck reactions that I've discussed in my earlier videos, we can also do coupling reactions using tin-containing compounds, which are called stannanes, and a palladium tetrakis triphenylphosphine catalyst. That's what this catalyst is called. This type of reaction is called a Stille reaction, which I'll show you now. In this example, I can take a phenyl bromide and react it with this type of molecule, which is called a stannane. Now note that tin is typically attached to three butyl groups and then some other group. Whatever my other group is ends up replacing the halogen in my halide coupling partner in my final product. Here's another example showing that you don't just have to have halides, you can also do this with triflate groups. In this case, my stannane is attached to four total butyl groups. Thus, the other group in this particular stannane happens to also be a butyl group. As a result, this triflate ends up getting replaced by a butyl group in my final product. This is the Stille reaction. Which brings us to a wonderful set of example problems from our problem set. I want you to predict the product or products of the following Stille reactions. In my typical style, I'm going to show you the answers to these momentarily. So if you wish, you can pause the video now and attempt them first on your own. In our first example, I've got this aryl bromide reacting with this stannane. This BU right here is an abbreviation for butyl. So remember, I've always got this tributyl tin group attached to some other group. Whatever the other group is, ends up replacing the halogen in my halide coupling partner. So the first question I ask is, what is the other group attached to my tin? It is, of course, this whole group right here. The next question I ask is, where is my halogen? It is, of course, located right here. Now, for the sake of keeping track of things, I've numbered the carbons in our other group attached to our tin as 1, 2, and 3. When I react these two molecules in the presence of palladium tetrakis triphenylphosphine and THF solvent, I end up replacing the bromine with this whole group that's attached to my tin, giving me this product, with the carbons numbered 1, 2, and 3. This is what a Stille reaction does. This is our next example. First question I ask is, what group, aside from the three butyl groups, is attached to my tin? It is, of course, this group right here. The next question I ask is, where is my halogen? It is, of course, located right here. For the sake of keeping track of things, I'm going to go ahead and number the carbons in my organostanane. One, two, three, and four. In my final product, what ends up occurring is my halogen, in this case of bromine, ends up getting replaced by this entire group that's attached to my tin, which ultimately gives rise to this product, where I've numbered the carbons one, two, three, and four as indicated. Here are some final Stille reaction questions. Predict the products formed by these Stille coupling reactions. In this case, I'm not going to show you the answer, but will let you attempt to do them on your own. I want to finish this video by sharing a couple of things with you briefly that I find to just be historically interesting. Suzuki and Heck, whose reactions I've discussed in my preceding video, alongside with another chemist, named Nagishi, who also invented a type of coupling reaction that I'm not going to discuss in, the, in my chapter videos, shared the 2010 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for discovering these coupling reactions, the Suzuki, Hack, and Nagishi reactions. Now, if you want to learn more about that, you're welcome to look them up at this HTML address, or you can just Google it. Now, one thing I've already stated is this. I do not require you, my students, to know any of the mechanisms of these coupling reactions. If any of you are curious about them, however, I'll be happy to show you those mechanisms outside of class. Before moving on, I want to also digress and share something important about the discoverer and inventor of the Stille coupling reaction, whose name is John Kenneth Stille. I'm going to do that by actually showing you what's currently written in the Wikipedia article about him. I happen to have a soft place in my heart for John Kenneth Stille, and the reason is because not only did he invent this really cool reaction, the Stille coupling reaction, but he also, up to the time of his retirement, was a professor at Colorado State University, which is where I worked as a postdoctoral researcher under the mentorship of Professor Robert M. Williams, who is also a fantastic organic chemist. 
The Wikipedia entry on him mentions that. It said, still he began his independent career at the University of Iowa in 1957 before moving to Colorado State University in 1977. One thing that's very sad about Stilly is this. It mentions that he was killed at age 59 in an airplane crash in Sioux City, Iowa. It's also important to note that the Wikipedia article mentions specifically that in 2010, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to Hack, Nagishi, and Suzuki, as I just mentioned, for their work on palladium catalyzed cross-coupling reactions. The Stilly reaction is also a key part of palladium catalyzed cross-coupling chemistry, and it is widely regarded that John Stilly was a likely candidate for the Nobel Prize before his untimely death. My postdoctoral advisor, Robert M. Williams, who knew Stilly personally very well, because they were colleagues at the same university, also shared this opinion very strongly. The Nobel Prize, incidentally, is not awarded to people posthumously. Thus, if you die, you cannot receive it. But once again, it seems very likely that Stilly may have shared this Nobel Prize in one way or another if he had not died at the early age of 59 back in 1989 which is, of course, extremely sad. I want to finish now, just for the sake of curiosity and interest, by showing you a total synthesis of a molecule that happens to feature a Suzuki coupling reaction. This paper I'm going to show you actually features both a Suzuki coupling reaction as well as a Stilly coupling reaction. This research project was originally published back in 2008 from the Journal of the American Chemical Society by collaborative efforts coming out of the University of Scripps, Florida and the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The only reason I'm showing it to you is once again just because it is a very cool total synthesis of a useful molecule that involves two of the coupling reactions I've taught you thus far. The objective of this research was to synthesize this molecule, compound number one, which is called superstolid A. This molecule, superstolid A, is a natural molecule that was discovered as a secondary metabolite from a sponge originating from the South Pacific. The reason this molecule is worthy of attention is because it's highly cytotoxic toward a few cancer cell lines, including P388 leukemia cells, human nasopharyngeal cells, and non-small cell lung carcinoma cells. For those of you who've taken lab organic chemistry from me, you can see the IC50 values located here. And you should note that they are highly potent, all being very small single digit numbers in nanograms per mil. For those of you who haven't taken the lab course from me, don't worry about that stuff. Unless you really want to, you can look it up. Now you can see as I scroll down this paper that the total synthesis is very, very long and involved, starting with this molecule 9 and doing a bunch of organic chemistry reactions to convert it over various steps into a target molecule 4, whose picture is actually shown right here. The first reaction I'm going to show to you is a Stilly reaction. You can see this molecule right here, 24, has a vinyl iodide in it, an iodine that's stuck directly to an alkene. It is being reacted with molecule 5. You'll note that molecule 5 is a stanane. It's got a tributyl tin group in it attached to this exciting appendage over here. It's of course reacted with palladium that has some different ligands on it other than the tetracus triphenylphosphine I've taught you earlier. But the point is this. Just as occurs in the stilly coupling reactions that I showed you in the slides before, what ends up happening is this entire appendage attached to this tin ends up taking the place of the iodine in this molecule 24, ultimately giving me molecule 25. You can see where that bond has been formed between this carbon right here and this carbon right here, right in this location here. That is a stilly coupling reaction. The next coupling reaction featured in this total synthesis involves another vinyl iodide, except this time it's being coupled with an alkyl borane. You can see the borane group right here. I've got a boron attached to a carbon, and it happens to be in the same molecule as the vinyl iodide itself. When this molecule is treated with a palladium, as shown over here, and a base. Now note, this base is not hydroxide, as I taught you earlier, is typically used in a Suzuki coupling reaction. Instead, this is tellurium ethoxide, which is just another base. What occurs is I form a bond between this carbon right here, the one that's attached to the iodine, and this carbon right here. You can see where that bond has been formed in this product, molecule 3, right here. It's been formed right here at this position. This is a Suzuki coupling reaction. 
Ultimately, just so you know, molecule 3 was converted over a few more steps into the target molecule, superstolate A, whose structure is shown here. All right, thank you everyone for tuning into this video. I hope you've had an enjoyable time. Please stay tuned for my next one in which I'll talk to you guys about our final reaction for chapter 11, which is called olefin metathesis. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.